As always, I'm thankful to be before you once again. Thankful for every opportunity that I'm given to speak God's word. I want you to think with me now to the idea that even before our universe began, the church of Christ existed in the mind of God. This body of the saved has always existed in God's mind as part of God's ultimate method of man's salvation, man's redemption. One can find throughout the Old Testament multiple prophecies regarding this church and due to the extensive records of this entity there should be no doubt in anyone's mind as to certain desires that God has regarding this church. It is apparent that God wants every man alive all of mankind to know that one, the church exists, to understand exactly what it is, to realize its great importance, and ultimately to be saved and subsequently added to this church by the Lord. Now we as Christians are expected to be able to teach others about this very institution. Are we able to do so? Now, obviously, as we grow, we'll be better fit to do so. But we still must at least know something about it. Now, as is true with everything that God creates, Satan seeks to pervert and to destroy it. We see from the very beginning, God creates the world, Man and woman, what does Satan do? He seeks to destroy them. He brought about the sin of mankind, and as a result, death followed. You see the children of Israel, God's people under the Old Testament law system, continuously Satan attacking. Now he uses human means, but eventually Israel would fully succumb to idolatry, they'd be taken to a captivity, a remnant would return, and even today, attacks on the Bible, attacks on marriage, attacks on the home, attacks on worship, attacks on the church, her purity, her structure. Whenever truth is present, you can believe that Satan will follow to try to disrupt, distort, and destroy any who try to practice truth. Now, I would like to consider this with respect to the church and consider for the next few moments some misconceptions about the church of Christ, the Lord's church. Our first misconception who actually established the Lord's church? Who established the church of Christ? Some have made the claim that Alexander Campbell established the church of Christ. Members of the church of Christ have been sometimes called Campbellites. I myself has been, have been called this term. It's been a while, but I've been called that. This title... This word Campbellite was first coined by Robert K. Owens in a debate that he had over the existence of God with Alexander Campbell. Now Campbell is often credited with establishing the Church of Christ in America, the United States. Now he was obviously very instrumental in the widespread attempt to call men back to pure, plain, biblical teaching. Due to this, he was incorrectly attributed as the founder of the Lord's Church. Even 
Alexander Campbell himself refuted this very idea. He was identified as the founder of a religious group by the New Orleans Commercial Bulletin and he responded as follows. This is taken from that, it's a partial quote. It says, you have done me, gentlemen, too much honor in saying that I am the founder of a denomination quite respectable in many portions of the West known as Christians. I have always repudiated all human aids and human creeds and shall feel very grateful if you will correct the erroneous impression which your article may have made in thus representing me as the founder of a denomination. Alexander Campbell himself denied this accusation that he founded a religious entity, denomination or otherwise. History records similar events. We already know that many others were already calling men to the Bible to remove themselves from human creeds, to return to biblical authority, especially in matters of religion. To name a couple, James O'Kelly, Abner Jones, and Barton Stone. There are other references that we can find throughout this country's history with respect to the existence of the Church of Christ. And the two examples I have these churches were in existence before Alexander Campbell was ever born. The firm foundation, May 4th, 1971, that issue for that month, they had a picture in that, that issue. It read as follows. Church of Christ, 1710. Meeting house of the Church of Christ in Romney Marsh in Revere, Massachusetts. Building erected, 1710. Thomas Sheber, first settled minister, died December 27, 1749, aged 91 years. So even before we had declared our independence, the Church of Christ existed in this country. F.B. Shrigley, I'm assuming I'm saying these right, I don't know. Either way, apologies to these two people. F.B. Shrigley wrote, or he recorded minutes from a men's business meeting from a congregation dated November 17, 1736, for the North Yarmouth Church of Christ near present-day Salina, Tennessee. Alexander Campbell was not born until 1855. How does it make sense, then, if he's the founder of the Church of Christ, if it's already in existence? What does the New Testament teach about this idea? <clears throat> we know that though great was Alexander Campbell's work, all he did was plant the seed of the kingdom. Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Again, not to diminish his work for great and good that it was, and it's good anytime this occurs. But it can be likened whenever I go buy a pack of seeds for watermelons, I prepare a plot of soil, I plant those watermelon seeds, I provide water and nutrients. What fruit do you think will be produced when those plants have met their time? Cabbage? Apples? Obviously not. It's going to be a watermelon. We all understand that. If I did not or excuse me, I did not make those watermelon seeds. I purchased them. I got a supply of them. But I didn't make them. I planted them. I sowed those seeds. And the fruit was bore later on. The New Testament teaches that Jesus established the church. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. He promised to build it. And later in Acts chapter 2, we see that being fulfilled. The church of Christ became a reality. Whenever the gospel is preached and obeyed, the result is the same, regardless of who the speaker is. Whether it's Alexander Campbell, 
or anyone else for that matter, preaching God's word. When the gospel is heard, Romans 10, 17, when the gospel, or when Christ and his deity is believed, John 8, 24, when one's sins are repented of, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, when one publicly confesses Christ as the Son of God, Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, and when one is immersed in water, Acts chapter 22, verse 16, the result is a new creature, a Christian, not a Campbellite, one who is of Christ, the founder of the church. You see, each time God's pattern for salvation is followed, the result is the same. This was true in the first century when this was preached for the very first time on that first Pentecost day. It was true a thousand years ago. It is true today. And it will be true until time as we know it is no more. So again, that is one misconception about the church. The Church of Christ was not founded by Alexander Camel. But however, building on this false claim, this brings us to our second misconception. The Church of Christ is just one denomination of many. One claim is that the church is made up of many denominations. And the Church of Christ is just a part of that group, a part of a whole. As if you take a $100 bill, you want to break it, say on all ones. Now you have 100 denominations of that $100 bill. Is that the concept of the Lord's church? Some hold that one church is as good as another. Even some in the first century held this idea. Some brethren wanted two churches. Because keep in mind... There were no denominations in existence in the first century. You couldn't find a Baptist. You couldn't find a Pentecostal. You couldn't even find a Catholic. You found Christians. You found pagans. Further still, some brethren wanted two churches. One Jewish and one Gentile. One for the circumcised and and one other one for the uncircumcised. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, deals with this matter. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You see, God never intended for more than one church to exist under the New Testament law system. Only one entity was authorized to exist. In this one entity, one is able to enjoy salvation, to be able to worship properly their creator, to enjoy fellowship with their creator, and to enjoy fellowship with all others who are faithful to their creator. How then does it make sense for multiple denominations, different bodies to exist? They exist, but they do not have authority by God to exist. And thus Christians have no fellowship with darkness. Now this type of division is condemned in the New Testament. It plainly teaches that Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. As head, he is commanded that there be no division among us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. That there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Jesus prayed for the unity to exist between his disciples and ultimately with him and God. John chapter 17. We are told how this unity is to be accomplished. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. <clears throat> says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Members of the church are expected to speak the same thing, to have the same mentality or attitude, and possess the same judgment. Now, we're not saying we're mindless robots, but when you have the same standard that you're operating from, you will be able to preach the same exact thing. If you have the same goal, you're going to have the same attitude in obtaining that goal. And if you're using the same standard, God's word, you'll be able to supply righteous judgment. The same judgment that Jesus himself would use. This is only accomplished by relying upon the same standard, which would be God's word. Specifically, the New Testament. Furthermore, Jesus demonstrated to us how unity is accomplished. He, he showed us. Not only is it written, but he showed us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Here's the key. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You want to know how to have unity with the Father? Look at the life of Christ. You want to know how to have unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Look at how he lived upon the earth. Not only does he expect us to have this unity, to uphold his truth in applying it, he showed, it, he showed us how to do it with his life, his example. He was always about his father's business. We note that he did only those things that would please the father. He was obedient even when it required his death, even when it cost his physical life. How can anyone then make the claim that they're doing God's will while simultaneously not obeying the New Testament? How can anyone cry, go to the church of your choice, and expect still to be pleasing to God? However, some do. <clears throat> I found this quote from Rubel Shelley. He evidently is on record of saying this. The church has got to change. If it doesn't change, my kids are not going to stay with it. I'm probably going to stay with it. Not sure, but my children won't stay in it if it doesn't address the issues that are real in their world. They won't stay with a tired institution that calls itself the church. To which I would respond, good riddance. The church does not need cowards. When you look at the armor of God, Ephesians 6 Everything that's protected is the front of the body. Because that's how you fight. What happens if you turn and run? There's nothing covering you. Christians are meant to stand and fight, not bow to the denominational world and its false doctrines. And many have followed after the mentality of this Rubel Shelley. Many have decided to cling to false doctrines. Instead of having the mindset of Abraham, 
Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. Where is the mentality that God knew Abraham would command both his children and his, his grandchildren to be faithful? Do you see that in the quote we just read? Oh, my kids aren't going to stay. Well, that tells more about yourself than your children. Obviously, they're responsible for themselves, but mom and daddy, where are you? Are you teaching your children to be good? Not just to be responsive and non-rebellious to what you tell them, but to be good in the eyes of God. Train them up on how to live as a Christian. That example extends to your grandchildren. If you teach your, ki your children how to do right, and they do right, they grow up to be their own individuals, accountable before God, and they learn to be faithful, what do you think they're going to teach their children if they have a backbone? They're going to teach the Bible. This is why we have the idea that the church is only a generation from apostasy. Because we have people like Rubel Shelley, I know this was a while back, but we have that mentality even today. We don't have the idea generally, the mentality of Joshua and his family. We often attribute that to only Joshua, but he says, me and my house will serve the Lord, Joshua twenty four fifteen. There is only one church that is acceptable to God. Do we fight for it? Do we stand up for her doctrine? Do we proclaim it boldly? Do we proclaim it at all? Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. This body of the saved must uphold the mind of God, the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The New Testament is just as alive and fresh as it ever was. It has no need for renovation. Nor does the church, the bride of Christ. God's word only needs proper application in our lives. Now our third misconception. What is the work and mission of the church of Christ? Some believe that the church is here to provide recreational activities and even entertainment for its members. Some think the local assembly should supply areas for play, like a gymnasium, soccer fields, volleyball courts, basketball courts, or some sort of park. If you want that, go to Chick-fil-A. They assume that the church should provide a fun atmosphere or a fun place for their children. Sometimes this would even include times of worship. We've got to have children in somewhere else to keep their minds occupied, to make sure that they're still having a good time in worship. So we have a divided assembly. Wholesome recreational activities are beneficial to children. I don't think anyone would deny that. It helps with their development. It helps them take a nap, too. But this responsibility does not fall upon the church to discharge. The church is not here to babysit. Some may have used various Bible study programs by dropping off their children and accepting these classes as free child care. While the children are benefiting, that is a terrible mentality to have. The Church of Christ is not a babysitter's club. While we might offer to take care of children, that is not the work of the church. It is never the responsibility for the church to operate in that fashion. Members ought to realize that this, these responsibilities are borne by the home. The responsibility for recreating their respective children falls to the home. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. Aside from this, many today want some type of uplifting experience in worship. What this normally means is they want some kind of rock concert. They want flashing lights, various instruments, fog machines. 
maybe even performers on stage. They'll want praise teams, choirs, and maybe even yell leaders. But such performances are perversions of God's prescription for worship. They make a mockery of God himself and his word, specifically the New Testament, but even the Bible at large. Simply put, these things are not authorized. Therefore, they are displeasing to God. Consider Numbers chapter 24, verse 13. You're having a conversation here with Balaam and Balak. Verse 13 says, if, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. The church is not a house of circus acts. Barnum and Bailey have that covered. And if that's the sort of worship you're wanting, you're in the wrong place. The church of Christ is not authorized to supply such. To borrow a quote from a former president, John F. Kennedy, ask not what the church can do for you, but ask what you can do for the church. Oftentimes, being good Americans, we try to go out and give me, give me, give me. What can I do for me? Seldom do we ask, what can I do for the Lord? What can I do to help the church? We're probably going to have a work day soon to take care of things on the grounds here. Can we rely on you to pitch in, offer your services? I got a strong back and a weak mind. I'm fit for pretty much whatever we got going on here. Are you going to be here to help? Now, I understand things come up. You can't. Well, what can you do for the church? Usually the question is, what, what kind of classes do you offer my children? What, what kind of enter, entertainment do you have for me and my family? Well, it's very seldom asked, well, what kind of work do you do at this congregation? How can we be more involved? You don't really hear that. What then is the authorized work and mission of the Church of Christ? The mission of the Church of Christ is to save souls. And that is done by spreading the gospel. Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The primary way that this is discharged by the church is through evangelism. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Wherever the first century Christians went, so went the gospel. Reasonable people with good hearts eventually were converted. Luke chapter 8. Such methods might include personal contact radio programs, door knocking, online broadcasting, various forms of print, whatever is most advantageous for that individual Christian or the assembly collectively. Secondly, the church is expected to engage in edification. The focus here then is to attempt to keep current members of the church faithful. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. That passage sums up basically the growth process of the church. It started out as an infant. God prescribed miracles to help them. But once the New Testament letters were compiled into a book form, the need for miracles ceased. And through that compiled book, the New Testament, the church was able to better be fitly joined together and to edify itself in love. They didn't have to rely on a prophet to tell them what God wanted them to do. They could thumb over to some of these writings and say exactly what God said about the subject. God designed miracles to edify the early church, yet when the New Testament would be compiled, that would take the miracles place. 
Thus, sound preaching, Bible classes, midweek gatherings, special classes, VBS, and different, like, ladies' days. It was announced earlier, this coming Tuesday is a ladies' class. That's a special class. It's designed to edify, specifically, ladies of the congregation. That's a good thing. That's one way the church is, is to edify one another. We also edify one another by helping and even correction. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And third, the church is to engage in benevolent acts. Each member of this church, and even the church collectively, have a responsibility to care for those who cannot help themselves. Not choose not to, but who cannot help themselves. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. James chapter 1, verse 27. And Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. Jesus speaking there, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? God's going to provide for his children. We as, ch we as Christians carry that work out. Opportunities abound. We just had Hurricane Burrell hit. We had flooding. We had severe storms. We had power outages. We could provide meals. Oftentimes, whenever there's a funeral, the family's in distress and they're in their mourning period, that's normal. We can provide meals for them. They've got more important things to concern themselves than preparing food. We as members of the church, that's a prime opportunity to, one, comfort them, but also provide for their physical needs. Even helping people with stalled vehicles. Might be some severe flooding. Little car gets knocked into the ditch. Can't see the road. Folks with a truck, toe strap, yank them out of that ditch. Very simple act. Might take a little while. She might have just helped the family get home a lot quicker and for free rather than relying on a tow truck to get them home. Such care is, is to be extended to both Christians and non-Christians. Benevolence serves as really a supplement to both evangelism and edification because ultimately you want to show your Christian example in helping others with the idea of helping them spiritually. That should always be our end goal. These categories cover what the New Testament expects and authorizes of the Church of Christ and individuals, mem individual members of that church to do. Going beyond these is to act in rebellion to God, going without God's approval. Now, this morning we have considered three misconceptions about the Lord's church. There are many others. But we've considered errors regarding its founder, its oneness, and its mission. As Christians, we must be able to defend against such attacks, such mis misconceptions. But we must also give heed that we too must refrain from effectively altering God's word in any way. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Because we too can fall. We too can distort God's word when we present it. Now, as you study, that is less likely to happen, but it still needs to be on your mind. We need to be realizing that as I read the Bible, as I present it, I am speaking on God's behalf. Am I presenting God's mind or am I presenting my mind on the matter? We must ensure that we are teaching the one gospel that Jesus would approve of in its entirety and its purity. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. Now we have pointed out what is necessary in order for one to become a Christian. If you're not a Christian, 
Why not become one? Yet for those who have already become a Christian, maybe you've not been living as a Christian ought to be. Take the next few moments to make these sins known. Confess, repent. We'll pray for your forgiveness. God has promised us that when we comply with his terms of pardon, he will forgive. If you need to render obedience in either of these, please make it known as together we now stand and sing.